came here for me watching how I open files for 50 minutes, yes? Because what I'm planning to do is actually try to open file in Java for the next 50 minutes. Yeah, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the truth is that, uh, you know, uh, when in January I thought I will do a talk about I.O. in Java, uh, the plan was that it would be a really optimistic talk. And uh, lots of hope and, uh, and you know, we'll be all grateful for whatever people coding OpenJDK did. But uh, when I finally started to uh, build my slides, it turned out into like uh, boundless sadness. And I'm really sad, and you will be. Uh, and I hope that after this talk, you will abandon Java once and for all, forever, and move to Pony. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, OK. Because uh, I know that uh, I have not a lot of enough time because I tested this presentation yesterday. So I'm Jarek, I'm working at Allegro, and I'm uh, involved in a couple of different conferences in Poland. So this is not important because what is important is this. Any metal, sludge metal, stoner metal fans here? Yeah. Yes. So the first sleep album in the last 20 years was released a couple of weeks ago. So enjoy. Really good music, uh, especially if you into drugs, drinking, and all this funny stuff. <coughs> uh, why I did this talk? Uh, because I truly believe. I'm sorry, this is not not a cat. Cats are really popular these days on presentations. Unfortunately, this is Richard, and uh, the part of my talks uh, I do in at conferences are because I want to learn something. And uh, yes, this is this kind of presentation when I want to show you what I learned about I.O. in Java. Stay with me. Uh, this is Java 10, of course. Uh, it compiles. It works. Uh, it was coded in Eclipse. You know the size of the fonts. Uh, <coughs> so what can be interesting in this small little snippet of code? What kind of magic happens behind it? Do we really know what Java does? And this is the question for this presentation. It's simple. You open a file. Actually, you create a file object. And you create a file input stream. And you read bytes and all happy. And everything is good. <clears throat> Until this moment when you realize that the file object in Java is not actually file descriptor from the operating system. So file object in Java is, uh, I don't know how to call it in English, but in Polish we call it Vidmuszka, uh, because it is used to manipulate the paths and, and finding the canonical path and, and uh, working with file and path separat separators and create new directories, checking if file exists, and all these nice file operations. The one thing that file object doesn't do is open the file. Uh, what, how... Uh, file object does it. It delegates all the calls to the file system implementation. This is interface. And there are a couple of file system implementations. We have Unix file system, Windows file system, Mac OS file system implementations. So file is not a file actually in Java. Yeah? <coughs> it's just a, some kind of hoax uh, to check if the file exists. What is more interesting is <coughs> how you work with file in Java. What happens? Somebody says that Java is operating system. Yeah, I was somebody has said to me this once that Java is operating system. Actually, it's not. Uh, it tries to mimic the operating system. This is virtual operating system because at the end of the day, Java has to ask this man, grumpy, old, nobody loves him, but he knows everything. The operating system. I don't. I know that you ignore him. Yeah, because at least you will. Sc uh, spin next Docker instances and you don't care. But he's sitting there and he doesn't like Docker and he doesn't like Java. Look at his face, you know, oh, yet again Java, again new Java process running on me. Why? <coughs> How you access uh, the files in operating system? Uh, through file descriptors. This is a special structure, uh, quite easy. The 
the normal operating systems, I'm talking about Unix operating system because Windows is not operating system, it's a kind of joke from operating systems. And the second operating system, the Mac OS, is also a joke. Uh, <coughs> yes. Uh, in every normal operating system, uh, you have a system-wide table which stores so-called file descriptors. And file descriptors are references to an open file. The file descriptor keeps two informations, the offset of the current uh, operation you, you are doing on the file. So whenever you progress reading next byte, the file descriptor keeps the uh, the number of the bytes you uh, you have recently read, and uh, of course some meta information about uh, the file, like the size of the file, is it the linked uh, file, or is it the, mm, the permissions uh, like read or or write. So if file in Java is not file descriptor, what is file descriptor? It is file descriptor. Uh, who knows? Who's seen this class? It is public API file descriptor. Okay, one person. So. You're weird. <coughs> and we think we know how to program. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Joke. Uh, file descriptor has a field called FD, file descriptor. It's an int. Uh, and it stores actual operating uh, system file descriptor value. So this is the one of the things file descriptor does. The second thing file descriptor does, it handles really tricky GC uh, <coughs> tricks. Because you can have one file descriptor open, and this one file descriptor can be, can be passed to many file input, file output streams. But if you do it, and you have many file input, file output streams with the same file descriptor, when you call close on the file input stream or output stream, you should not close the file descriptor, because there are other files probably reading from this. Yeah? So there is a tricky mechanism uh, which counts the number of the file open streams, file input streams, and file output streams on this file descriptor. And it's like a reference counting. Whenever the number of open files on this file descriptor reaches zero, then it can be garbage collected and, and removed. So this is a pretty tricky thing that file descriptor does for us. <coughs> okay. So what happens when you do write on the file? I know that you do Spring, you look like. Uh, but have you ever wondered when you are doing coding, yeah, you do something, and this moment when you close your eyes and you see what, what the system does, this moment of reflection, yeah? what really happens? Am I hurting somebody with this request? So <clears throat> let me show you. This is what happens. First, you call write on a file output stream. Then it calls file output stream write bytes, which is native wrapper, so the method with the native keyword, which delegates the call to the Java Java IO file output stream write bytes method, which is actually in C and it's system operating dependent. Okay, so you have different uh, implementations of this file output stream write bytes method depending on the, this is the location in OpenJDK project. Uh, write bytes, which in fact delegates this call to shared native library, write bytes, which at the end does what it does, calls the operating system, the old grumpy man, saying write these bytes to, to storage. Okay? Simple. <coughs> not. It's not simple. It's C code. So it will be a lot of C code, probably more C code than Java code. I will explain. This is write bytes from the actual OpenJDK 9 uh, implementation. It hasn't changed since the beginning of Java. Two important things. Uh, here you have hard-coded uh, the buffer size, and it's 8 kilobytes. Okay? So you have something hard-coded in OpenJDK. The next thing, you have a stack allocated buffer of this size. So you have 8 kilobyte buffer allocated on stack. It's still simple. Look at this. If you are reading more than 8 kilobytes, it actually allocates in the operating system extra memory for the buffer. So every time you read less than 8 kilobytes, you don't have this extra allocation because this is stack allocated buffer, 
everything is okay. But if you read above eight kilobytes, it does this extra allocation. Okay? And of course, the allocation. This is like a team. This is for me a moment of boundless silence, sadness. Because you know, you would expect that it would be a little bit clever when allocating every time you do write eight kilobytes outside of the heap. Yeah, this is non-Java heap, C heap. <coughs> so it's costly. Yeah. <coughs> the next thing that happens beneath is this. The first line. What it does, it actually does copy of your Java buffer from your Java space to this new buffer in your JNI space. Okay, you have two words, the Java word and JNI word. What you see here is Java native interface word. So you need to copy the bytes from your buffer in Java, from your lovely byte buffer, to the nasty structure allocated uh, in the C code. So this is extra copy uh, operation. <coughs> Why? Because GC. Imagine you have a Java buffer in a memory location, and you pass this Java buffer to JNI code, and you want to read the content of this buffer to your device. But in the meantime, what happened? The GC run, and this buffer is in different memory location, but the JNI code doesn't know it because it used a pointer. So you would be reading random bit of memory. So this is the reason you have to copy this byte, uh, Java byte buffer to C buffer to make sure that in the meantime, meantime when GC happens, we are safe and we are not writing your passwords which are stored in memory, because it can happen. <coughs> okay. Is there a hope? Can we do it better? Actually, uh, we can, but we don't use it. It's called Java and I.O. It's new I.O. Yeah, it's not blocking I.O., it's new I.O. And it happened around Java 5, but so when I grab through code, we are still using file output stream and file input stream, and I don't see a lot of file channel usage. And now I'm trying to, try to prove that file channel is much better. <coughs> At the first, it doesn't look like it's much better. <coughs> <coughs> Because the stack trace is longer, but if you see the majority of the stack trace for the write operation on file channel happens in Java, okay? And there is only one native call at the end for the file dispatcher, different implementation per uh, operating system, uh, and just one native call comparing to, to the old implementation. So the question is how they deal with this GC thing but you, you can move the buffer and actually try writing the memory you don't really own, okay? <coughs> the first thing, that file input channel has a cache of buffers. So it doesn't allocate every time, it maintains a cache of buffers, okay? So it has a like, um, for different sizes, cache, and every time you try to write, you do the same trick, you have to copy it, but you, use, you copy it to the direct byte buffer, you are not using my memory allocation. You are using the Java 5 direct byte buffer. You have a cache, so you don't do memory allocation because you, you reuse memory region. And even in Java, there is a, a setting, JDK NIO max cache buffer size. So you can set it, for example, to 128 kilobytes. It means that whenever the portion of file you're trying to write is smaller, it won't allocate, it will use cache. Uh, of course, for speed, uh, you should not share cache. <laughs> so cache is thread local, uh, and every thread that does file operation has its own uh, uh, cache and uh, for buffers. And of course, they, the caches are evicted uh, according to last re least recently used algorithm. Is it all what happens? It's not, because there is even deeper things that are happening. Uh, if you know me, uh, you know that from the last year, I'm in deep love with SysDig. This is a tool for Linux to, to trace uh, operations and what actually programs do with the 
uh, operating system. This is something you can, uh, if you install SysDeek, uh, run on your machine and it will print out all the accesses to the file geek on JS, JSON from Java processes. So if you run it, because we don't have time, I run it for you, if you trust me, you get something like this. But first you have the open operation, so you open the file, then you do fstat, so you check the size of the file and the permissions and all the different things, and then you do the read operations of size of 15, 512. Is it that simple? Linux 4.1. This is the I.O. stack the official diagram of the I.O. stack of Linux 4.1. So if you think that opening file is nothing to talk about, we will go through every this block. Sorry, <laughs> I was kidding. <laughs> so <coughs> it's tricky, but uh, you can narrow it to this diagram, which is, I believe, much simpler. Yeah. So whenever you ask operating system to do the I.O. operation, it goes to the virtual file subsystem. It places your request on the queue, and then the driver, uh, SSD driver, SCSI driver, whatever you have, will pick this uh, request, it's called IO request, and write, read or write file for you. There are two important things that happen. It's page cache and IO scheduler. Because uh, who has uh, only SSD drive in their laptop now? Just SSD drive. It's getting better and better. Remember the times when there were disks spinning? Yeah? They were spinning pretty slow. So uh, the operating system had to do something to deal with the slowness of the disk. And they did two things, the page cache and IO scheduler. The page cache is every time uh, you read something on Linux, it first goes to the page cache and says, you know, I'm reading this part of the file Maybe by accident you have it in memory already. And the page cache may say, oh, I don't have it. And then it loads the portion of the file into the page cache. So next time you ask for the same part of the file, it will be not loaded from the storage, but from, uh, from the page cache. The same thing happens from, for writes. Your writes on the operating system in normal conditions are not written immediately to the storage. Okay? Uh, they are written to page cache. The page cache is marked dirty. And whenever operating system decides, it may say, okay, I will sync it with the file system. And it's a decision of, of the operating system when it happens. Of course, you have a minor control over it. So this is what happens when we read from disk. The driver reads the data, it copies it to page cache, then to JNI buffer, then to your application. It's not that easy. It takes time. <coughs> if you are curious like me, there are two interesting commands you can try on the uh, Linux. Sync forces all page caches to be synced with, uh, with storage. And this one, CCTL, invalidates all caches. So actually, you, you may see how slow system will become without page cache if you issue this command, the last one. The second thing that is interesting is IO scheduler. What is the slow, slowest operation on spinning hard drive? It's sick time, yeah? And you, you need to move your head around the cylinder and it takes time and disks are spinning and it's moving. So <coughs> the IO scheduler is introduced to do two things. One is to, if you see uh, this here, okay? So IO scheduler looks on the queue and he tries to lay out the request in a way that it will not have to seek through disks. So if the files are in the same location on the hard drive, uh, and IO scheduler know it, knows it, it shifts the request for reading to make sure that they will not require six. So this is the one thing that uh, IO scheduler does. The second thing that IO scheduler does is called merging. If you, for example, issue reading uh, from the same file in sequence, what IO scheduler does, it merges this in one bigger request. Yeah? It's easier to fetch uh, more bytes uh, than, you know, small chunks. Uh, so this is what uh, IOS scheduler does. Of course, it is not true for SSD uh, because there is no problem with seek time and different things. The, the mechanism is quite different. It's called multi-queue block layer. Uh, this is not this presentation. Go. <coughs> 
So what can we do to make it faster? We already see that this is not a trivial task to read from the file and write from the file. There are two things we can do. <coughs> One thing is we can use buffered I.O. in Java. Yes? Buffered input stream, uh, buffered, buffered output stream. There comes the moment of boundless sadness. The slide will be like six times today. So get used to it. Because uh, if your read or write request is bigger than the buffer size, what it does, it ignores the buffer. So if you rely on default settings like eight kilobytes, but this is the default value of the buffer, and you are reading 16 kilobyte blocks, you don't use buffer at all. Who invoked the buffer input stream uh, constructor with the value, the size? Nobody. You, I, yeah. Are you sure? Uh, <laughs> you rely on defaults, and defaults are alt kilobytes. Yeah, so it's not not a big thing. The second thing that you can go faster uh, with Java and I/O, it's called vector I/O. So uh, on file channel, uh, and this presentation is a kind of like a, a marketing for file channel, marketing presentation for file channel. Maybe maybe somebody will pay me for this. Uh, you can what you can do. You can create a vector of buffers. So many 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 byte buffers, and uh, there is a special method read which takes an array of buffers. And if your system opera operating system supports uh, vectored I/O. It reads the content of these buffers in, in a single syscall. It doesn't go five times, six times to the system. It goes once and says, you know, here I have six buffers. Please fill me up with data from this file. Okay? And this is just one run trip to, to the operating system. And we know syscalls are expensive, so it is already a benefit. How does it work? Actually, in uh, Linux, uh, there is a read file and write file operation. Uh, it's called scatter and input in and gathered output. Uh, so Java actually calls read file or uh, write file uh, if the operating system uh, supports it. What is interesting, but read file and write file are atomic. So you won't read random parts of the file. If you have concurrent access to file and many threads reading from the uh, same file, if you issue a vectored IO read, it will read the continue chunk of the file. So you can safely run it in concurrent environments. But where comes the moment of boundless sadness? Yet again, because you go to the OpenJTK and you seem see something like this. It checks some magical parameter in the operating system and if the value of this magical operating system is not set or is minus one, then you set this magical parameter to 16. Going to the documentation of Linux, you read that actually this magical parameter limits the number of buffers you can uh, pass to the write uh, and read file operations. And at the moment, in modern operating system, this value is 1024, but Java still thinks it's Linux 2.0, and you can have only 16 buffers. Sorry. Uh, so you can make it faster, but not too fast. <coughs> and this is what we can do when you have a typical workload. Uh, you can use buffer I.O. or you can use vector I.O. But what if you have a situation like this, but you really need a fast I.O. in your application? The one option you can have is memory mapped files. This is uh, available on modern operating systems, uh, including Windows. Uh, so what it does, it actually allows you to access your file as a memory. You open file in a memory mapped mo uh, uh, mode, and what you get, you get a buffer, which actually represents the content of the file. And you don't have to read uh, through this buffer like you read uh, in file channel or output streams or input streams. You don't have to read it like a stream. You can have a random access. You can, at any point of in time, say, give me the last byte. 
and you don't have to uh, skip through, through the whole file. Just give me the last byte. What happens is <coughs> that actually memory mapped files use the page cache mechanism. Okay? How it works? Uh, you get the byte buffer, and you say, give me the first byte. And if, uh, if this is memory map file, what happens, the operating system goes to the uh, page cache and says, OK, I don't have this part of the file, so I will load it up, map into the memory, and show you as a, uh, a part of memory. Whenever you write to this, you just write byte. You say byte, index, equals, something. You don't issue write operation, you don't issue read operations, you just manipulate the array. And the operating system, when he says, okay, I have too many dirty pages, uh, it can decide, but it, can, it, won't uh, it will sync the content of a memory mapped file with the actual file on the file system. So you don't do read writes, the operating system does read writes, and you just use it as a, uh, as a byte by array. What is interesting, it allows you to read into memory, or say read, but work with files which are larger than your physical memory. Because if you fit it in the page cache, and at some point of time you are reading till the end of the file, the operating system will say, OK, I don't have enough memory. I will invalidate uh, these old page caches and load the new a uh, chunk of the file you need. Okay? This way you can read 64 gigabytes, 120 gigabytes uh, uh, files if you have 8 gigs. Uh, it has less impact on your application latency because you just access it li like an array. Uh, and writes are done async in the kernel space. What is interesting, and this is not like all roses, it gives you something I call unpredictable performance because you don't know when the operating system will decide I need to flash it. Yeah? It's like GC almost. <laughs> you don't know. I need to flash it. You, can, you have control and you can uh, enforce flash programmatically or from the operating system with the sync command, but actually you don't have total control over it. What is even more interesting, you can use uh, memory files in so-called shared mode. So you can open one, the same file, from two different processes and communicate through the file. And it will be fast. And it's actually used in a couple of Java products. But you actually use the same file and writing and reading and using the msync uh, command, you can communicate through file without actually hurting your performance <coughs> very much. So how does it look like? Yeah. Uh, you do you take the file channel, you open the file, uh, whatever depends, you, whatever you want to read or write, and uh, you call the map operation. Uh, there are different map modes. Uh, you say from where to start, this is the size of the file you want to map, and what you get, you get mapped byte buffer, which is actually a byte buffer, so you, whatever you do with byte buffer, you can do with it. So all the flip operations, read, write, remaining, writing, it works. Where it works, because it's not universal tool. Yeah, uh, the thing I, what I have learned uh, is, if something is really really fast, it has really really narrow set of possible applications. It doesn't work in all cases. Okay, uh, where it's helpful. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, one of the drivers is the algorithm used to uh, replace the cache uh, pages. It's a modification of least recently used. It's called Clock Pro. But basically, it removes the oldest page caches to make a place for the new one. So you think, OK, it will be good for databases. Because if you keep indexes in memory map file, if you have index of a record which is not used, it will be not loaded by the operating system. And you don't care about it, because this is something that operating system does. You don't have to think about all these fancy algorithms because this is an uh, operating system. Uh, and it's used, for example, in Cassandra, and it's used in Neo4j as a storage for, for indexes or storage for actually the data files. In case of Neo4j, it's used map, mm, memory map files not only for indexes, but also for, for data. And Apache Kafka stores indexes, uh, stores indexes in, 
in memory about files. This is one of the reasons why it's fast. <coughs> but then comes the moment of boundless silence. <coughs> Sadness. <coughs> Look for it. This is actually a signature of map method. And what is important is this thing. Okay? But actually, you say, I want to map at this position a file of this size, and the size is long. Are you with me? Okay, so the next slide is really important. Because when you have a Java doc to this method, which says that size must be non-negative, but no greater than maximum size of integer. So why it's long? And why it's integer? Anyone? Because, as you see, we return here a byte buffer. And what is the type of the index in this byte buffer? What is the type of array index in Java? It's int. So actually, in Java, your memory map file, remember I told you you can open 128 gigabytes? In Java, no. <laughs> Sorry, it's Java. Quit it. Uh, because you can op open just two gigabytes. Because of this limitation, it's not because Java has broken mechanism or the operating system doesn't like Java so much. It's because we have selected, uh, we as a community or somebody selected it int as an index for arrays. Congratulations. Uh, so this is from the article. That's this case for this guy seems like a vintage design decision. I, I, I like it, vintage design decision. Okay. So you can have only two gigabytes. What you can do, because we are in Poland, and uh, I don't know how much you know about Poland, but we assume that majority of us are from Poland. If you say to Polish people, you can't do it, we will find a way to do it. And we found. One way, uh, I'm really proud of this emoticon. You know this is Unicode character. <laughs> so <laughs> it took me 20 hours to and the presentation two hours. So what you actually can do, you can use unsafe. And there is a native method in file channel called mmap0. This method is private, but you have unsafe. And the name says you can do unsafe operations. So what you can do, you can trick with the unsafe and call this private method. And what you get, you get the long. long. And this long is a pointer to memory map file. Once you have a pointer to memory map file, using unsafe, you can set and get values. Yeah? This is one thing you can do. The second thing, which, which doesn't require some misc unsafe, which actually will go away, uh, is that if you see, you can create multiple byte buffers over the same file, because nobody will Look here, yeah? I can have any size and I have position. So I can create 24 memory mapped buffers. First part of the file, second, third, yeah? And actually you can, uh, it's not nice because if you have continuous uh, memory region and you have all kind of serializers or deserializers, you will have to wor work around boundaries of the byte buffers. You will not have a continuous read. Uh, so some extra code, but doable. <coughs> okay. It's not everything. There is something called zero copy IO. <coughs> Do you remember this picture? And this is something like reading from the file. What happens when you read from the file and want to write it to another file? Simple copy of the content of the file. This happens. Yeah? So you actually go from driver to page cache, from page cache to JNI buffer, from JNI buffer to Java heap buffer. Then you need to copy this Java heap buffer to another Java heap buffer. You again go back doing write and JNI buffer page cache driver. A lot of operations and a lot of copying, copying of, uh, of content of the file. What if we can do this? Yeah? 
If you want to just copy and we don't to process these bytes, yeah, we don't to do any operations on it, we can actually say load it to page cache and save it from page cache. Uh, and your bytes doesn't have to go to the application layer. These colors have sense. This is application layer, this is the operating system layer. So there is a, a system call called send file, mm, which allows you to do this. With Java 5, we can do it in Java as well, with the transfer to and transfer from operations. What's funny is it works with sockets, because sockets are files. Connected socket is a file. So what you can do if you, for example, want to copy really fast something over uh, a protocol network, you do the transfer because you just want to copy. Yeah? Uh, what if you, want to, uh, if you are uploading a file and you just want to save it? You just do the send file. It is used in Kafka. Apache Kafka, and this is one of the reasons in Apache Kafka, the, the format of the log in Apache Kafka is exactly the same as the format of the network packet, because we are saving directly uh, a network packet to a disk without need to copy it to the uh, Java space. How does it work? Really simple. We open one file, we open second file, we do transfer to, thank you, we are done. And unfortunately, there is no moment of sadness. Because this works. I tried yesterday really hard to find something too, but I failed. So if you want to find something that doesn't work, uh, let me know. But it seems like sometimes they can manage and make it right. There is, there is uh, one last thing I want to share with you. It's direct I.O. <coughs> Remember this picture? I have removed one thing, a page cache. Sometimes you don't want to go to the page cache for two reasons. Uh, I will tell you which one in a minute. But what Linux does is uh, direct I.O. There is a special flag. When you open a file in Linux, you say O underscore direct. And it opens uh, this file in a direct mode. It means that every operation goes actually to storage and doesn't go to page cache, both for reads and for writes. So what are the reasons you don't need cache? The one reason is data integrity. Yeah? And direct I.O. is uh, quite heavily used in databases, because you need to be sure that actually what you have inserted in the database will be there after the restart. Or if your database process dies, you want to be sure that actually at least the part of the things you want to save is on the storage, OK? So uh, this is one reason. The second reason, again, databases. If you write databases, usually you will have your own caching mechanism. And you will be a lot smarter than an operating system in loading and unloading uh, uh, information from storage. So it is not useful to have two layers of cache, yeah? because if with one layer of cache, a lot of shit can happen. Imagine what can happen with two layers of cache twice the sheet. So if you implement your own caching, uh, you, can, you want to go and uh, yeah, uh, doesn't use, use page, cache, page cache. Fortunately, we have a moment of sadness here, I think. It is not supported in JVM, or it is. Actually, it is. And because it is implemented, there's some moment of boundless sadness. Why? Because this is not a pub public API. You can do direct I.O. in Java, but under one condition, you use this Sun NIO package, which all we know is not for private use, and nobody takes responsibility if the API changes, disappears, and so on and so on, and it's OK. But uh, there is no other way. And of course, this is public static, but this class is in a wrong package. Uh, to summarize, uh, because somebody told me I need to have a slide. Uh, if you leave uh, this room, uh, I want to make sure that you remember, if you write more than 8 kilobytes, just think about using file channel. Uh, 
If you are using buffered streams, make sure that if you are writing something bigger than eight kilobytes, set the size of the file channel, or you uh, set the size of the buffer, or use file channel and vector I/O. If you are doing vector I/O, remember the 16 16-byte mm, uh, 16 buffers limitation. And uh, when I was playing with it, I was tricked because I think I am reading the whole file, but actually I was writing first uh, kilobytes of the file. Uh, so please write tests. Uh, <laughs> the limitation of a memory map file is two gigabytes. Uh, there is a tr two tricks you can apply, and direct I/O is actually not possible. It is possible, but it's an unofficial API. Uh, this is all I had for today. I haven't talked about everything because I didn't talk al at all about concurrency uh, of file channel and file operations and about two special uh, system calls, pwrite and pwrite, which are really in Linux for concurrent access to files. Uh, and actually, file channel uses it. So maybe next year we'll talk about concurrency with I.O. We'll see. And now it's time for... <laughs> questions. Unusual, I have time for questions. So I think Java 10 has support for O-Direct. Isn't this what you mean? No, it doesn't have support. It was uh, introduced in Java 10, there was a... But it's still as as I haven't seen a possibility. Oh, it's an official. It's official IPR. Yeah. Yes, it's an so you need to show me where it is. Okay. I'll okay. Sure. Have, I haven't seen this, okay. so maybe it's 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 on file channel. When you open, there is an additional direct buffer flag. Yes. It's okay. A new flag, so yes. okay. Okay. So correction. Java 10 has official. <laughs> yeah. I have actually two questions. One is very simple. Can you remove the cursor from the screen? <laughs> it's, it's very, very puzzling. <laughs> it distracts us. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, <laughs> the second one is a bit more practical. Uh, what is actual performance gain that we should be, uh, uh, that you've measured, I hope, that from my perspective of a standard application developer that needs to open a JSON file to send Nothing. it over, uh, do I have to bother, or uh, files I/O like new I/O is is enough? From okay, if you do the standard thing, like you you know wasting your file time on opening JSONs, I can hug That's you later. Fine. Yeah, no worries. Uh, you won't see a lot of improvement, but uh, if you are working with things like Elastic, uh, like Cassandra, and you are installing these things and optimizing these these things, uh, and writing. Things for, for example, logging. Yeah, this is one of the reasons logging kills Java performance in many applications because they still, in many implementations, use the standard file. Yeah, and your logs are usually larger if you log JSON content uh, than eight kilobytes. Yeah. Okay, so so uh, having heard that, whenever I do kind of massive file yeah. operations, yes. that's if that's you lot of do a lot of operations and they are on the critical path. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.